my name is Matt Kennedy, and this is the Steadfast Podcast. This podcast exists to use Bible study and theological teaching to encourage you to be steadfast in your faith. Thank you for taking time out of your day to check out the Steadfast Podcast. I hope today's episode is an encouragement to you. Today we're going to do a Theology Explainer episode. We are going to take a look at the doctrine of the Trinity. Now for Christians, the Trinity is at the core of our faith because it describes who our God is. But it may also be the hardest thing for us to explain or understand. Now real quick, simple definition. By Trinity, I mean that our God is one God, yet three distinct persons. Father, Son, and and Holy Spirit. Mormons, Muslims, and other groups think we are absolutely cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs for believing this doctrine. They think we're crazy because it feels like there is a little bit of a contradiction within the definition itself. One God, three persons. Since we have this desire to understand, to explain things simply, Christians have come up with a lot of analogies. Maybe you've heard of some of these analogies before. Our first one, God is like water. Water can be in a liquid form. If it gets cold enough, it can be in a solid form. And if it gets hot enough, it can be a gas. One substance, three forms. Unfortunately, that analogy is wrong and it's heretical. And by heretical, I mean that it says something that is not true about God. It simply falls short. For the same substance can only be liquid, solid, or gas one at a time. It cannot all exist at the same time time. No molecule is capable of being liquid, solid, and gas simultaneously. If we project that onto God, in the theological world, that's a heresy known as modalism. Basically, it says that God can be the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit, but he can't be all three at the same time. Time. But what scripture says is that our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they all exist simultaneously. I want to show you proof of that later on. Our second analogy is that God is like a three leaf clover. Each leaf making up part of the whole that teaches a little bit of a math problem Father plus Son plus Holy Spirit equals God. Do you think that's better? <laughs> Nope, I am afraid it's not. It is still an inaccurate view of God. It suggests that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are in and of themselves not holy God. When I say holy, I mean like W-H-O-L-L-Y. They say they're not holy God, but rather it teaches that they are building blocks of God. This heretical view is called partialism. Basically, each person of the Trinity makes up part of God. Yet, as we will discuss, the Bible teaches the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. They are all holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy God. Here is our third analogy. God is like a star. With a star, you also have light and heat. The reason we have light to see anything on this earth is because the sun, the star at the center of our solar system, provides light. The reason it is warm enough for us to live and not die is is because that same star, the sun at the center of our solar system, provides heat. Stars produce light and heat. Some say God is like a star. you got the star itself, you got the light it produces, and the heat it produces. Do you think that is any better? Okay, you knew that was coming, right? Or were you thinking, maybe third time's a charm? Why is this one wrong? Well, it, it's pretty simple. You see, star, light, and heat, they're not equals. Actually, the light and heat only exist because the star produces them. This analogy finds its roots in a old heresy called Arianism. Arianism is this old and dangerous heresy that says that God the Father created the Son and created the Holy Spirit. Now, there is submission and authority within the Trinity. Matthew 26, verse 39, John 6, verse 38, 1 Corinthians 15, 28 are all good examples of teaching that. But even though there is authority and submission, there is still equality within the the Trinity. There are other analogies out there that fit into one of the three heresies I just mentioned. Modalism, partialism, Arianism. There's probably some other isms out there that we didn't cover. So you might ask, what 
analogy actually works. Let's just cut to the chase, right? Describe the analogy, call it a day. Okay, this is probably going to disappoint you. I honestly cannot think of any analogy that fully and accurately describes who God is. Not one. Now, I understand that might be frustrating, but as well-meaning as those analogies are, they miss the mark. And listen, I'm not sure if there could ever be a single topic out there that is worth being accurate on as much as it's worth being accurate about who God has revealed himself to be. Consider this. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah is given this great privilege of seeing the throne of God. While he sees the throne of God, he also sees these angelic beings called the seraphim. Listen to how these verses, verses 2 and 3, describe what they're doing. Quote, Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two, he covered his face, and with two, he covered his feet, and with two, he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. End quote. What do you think when you hear that these magnificent creatures called seraphim spend their day crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The Hebrew word we translate as holy is called kadesh. It is repeated three times, signifying completeness. Now listen, any time a word in the Bible is repeated, that is significant. But if it is repeated three times, that is going to represent completeness or wholeness, or you might even say perfection. The seraphim proclaim God to be completely, entirely, perfectly holy. Part of Kadesh is the concept of otherness or being separate. When you hear the word holy, you probably think of words like sacred. Well, something is sacred because it is set apart. It is considered to be other than the rest. God is separate from the rest of creation, meaning he is different than everything and everyone else. He is truly one of a kind. There is no one like him. So why should we expect to be able to describe this sacred, this holy God with things in the created order like water, plants, or stars? All of those things, including everything else, has been marred by sin. So to describe a holy and righteous God with things that have been stained or tainted by sin is truly crazy. It shouldn't be surprising for us that there's no analogy that really works well when we consider the difference between a holy, holy, holy God and a sinful, sinful, sinful world. Though I will fall short in this discussion today, he is worth us being as accurate as we possibly can. Can we agree on that? Can we agree that God is worth us doing everything we can do to be accurate on who he is? Absolutely, he's worth it. So while we may not have this nice, easy, catchy, repeatable analogy, we can get at what the Bible says about who God is. And really, that's going to be our goal. That is our goal. What does the Bible say about who God is as far as a trinity? One tricky thing is that when most people think about what they believe, they can really only operate in what we call a proof text. By that, I mean they find a verse, maybe they Google it, that clearly says the fact they're looking for. In a sentence or a few sentences, something clear and concise for them. For example, how do we know God loves the world? Well, John 3.16, being our proof text for this, says, for God so loved the world. That's a proof text. Sometimes, like the John 3.16 example, the proof text is spot on. But there are other times when a proof text can be changed, it can be manipulated, we can take it out of context, so that what we are saying it says is something radically different from what it actually is saying. Are you following? Let's use Philippians 4.13 as the example. Quote, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. End quote. I am sure you have heard this verse taken out of context to manipulate its meaning. It could go like, I want to make a lot of money. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I want to get that job. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. When in the actual passage in Philippians 4, Paul is actually talking about being content. Whether he has to go hungry or if he has a full belly, he's going to be content in Christ, which is why he says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. That's proof text. When it comes to the Trinity, we are talking about a doctrine that does not have such a text. In fact, the word Trinity doesn't even show up in our Bibles at all. It's just a word we use to describe what the Bible 
teaches. Do you remember high school math class where you had to write out proofs? Basically, it went like, if this is true, and this is true, and this is true, then that must be true. That's basically what we do to gather the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, before you start thinking, well, that sounds like shaky ground, what I want to do in this episode is make this case for you that shows that this is a clear, consistent, undeniable theme in the Bible. That is an undeniable truth in Scripture. It just takes a little bit of work to put it all together. So here's what we're going to do. I want to show you where the Bible calls the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit God, showing the deity of each person. That each person is holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy God. They're not part of a whole. They are holy God themselves. Then we will look at how the Bible speaks of God's unity, that there is only one God. So here we go. Three distinct divine persons one perfectly unified God. So let's start with the distinctions, the three distinct divine persons. First up is God the Father. The first verse I want to bring to your attention is John chapter 20, verse 17. Quote, Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. End quote. In this verse, Jesus clearly designates that the Father is God. Though, for most people, I would say God the Father is the simplest one to believe, right? But here's another verse. This comes out of 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Quote, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. End quote. The Father of Jesus is God. That is what Peter believed because that is what Jesus, the Son of God, taught. The Father is God. Listen, there are many other verses we could point to that would teach us the exact same thing. But because of the breadth of what we need to cover, I'm just giving two examples per person of the Trinity. So we're going to move on to God the Son, Jesus Christ. Our first passage here is going to be John chapter 1. Verse 1 and verse 14, quote, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory, glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth, end quote. So what we see here is that the Word existed before time, was somehow both with God and God Himself. Then one day, the Word became a man. John is talking about Jesus. This verse declares that Jesus is God and distinct from the other persons such as the Father. Though he was God, he was with God. We're going to be in John chapter 8, verses 58 and 59. Quote, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. End quote. I know this one might be a little bit less clear for us. But the reaction of the crowd really gives an amazing clue as to what's going on here. Think back to Moses. Think back to the burning bush. Moses asks God, who shall I say sent me? And which God replies, he says, I am. I am who I am. So Moses was supposed to go to the Israelites and be like, I am sent me. So who is he referring to with the words, I am? He's referring to God. So when Jesus is here saying, before Abraham was, I am, he is declaring himself to be God. And that was so clear to all the Jews in and around where he was. And we can see that it was so clear because they pick up rocks to throw at him. They want to stone him because they believe he is speaking blasphemy. And they believe the only appropriate response to blasphemy was to be stoned to death. So it was clear to them that Jesus was declaring himself to be God. So if we look at how it was said and how it was heard, it should be clear to us that Jesus is saying he is God. Let's keep moving. God, the Holy Spirit, going to be in Acts chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, quote, but Peter said, Ananias, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God." End quote. You can read this full story in Acts chapter 5 to get more context. It's a fascinating and really terrifying story. But the simple point I want to make here 
is that Peter is declaring that Ananias has lied to the Holy Spirit. Then to make his point stronger, he repeats himself. He doubles down and he says Ananias has lied to God. Peter is equating the Holy Spirit to God himself. He says, Ananias, you've lied to the Holy Spirit, which means Ananias, you have lied to God himself. Another example can be found in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 through 7. Quote, Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. End quote. These verses give extra points to our Trinitarian case. Paul puts the Holy Spirit and the Lord, also known as Jesus, on the same level, equating them both with God. He says the same Spirit, the same Lord, the same God. Paul is teaching the Holy Spirit is God and the Lord is God. There are honestly fewer verses on the divine nature of the Holy Spirit, but I think there's a pretty simple explanation as to why that is. In John 16, Jesus taught us that the Holy Spirit glorifies Him, glorifies the Son. It's not teaching that the Holy Spirit is less of God than Jesus is. It's that each person in the Trinity has a different role. There is authority and submission within the Trinity. But even though there is authority and submission, there is also equality. The Holy Spirit loves Jesus. The Holy Spirit desires to draw people to Jesus. What we see here is a perfect love, perfect delight and harmony in this divine Trinity. If we understand that it is the Holy Spirit who inspires men of old to write down the scriptures, and it was that same Holy Spirit that highlights Jesus above everything else, that shows a very pure love. So I I think it's reasonable for us to believe that there are fewer verses on the divine nature of the Holy Spirit, because this is an act of humility and an act of love. And that's a really beautiful thing, I think. We have showed verses that show the divine nature of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they are all distinct persons of God. But remember, they are distinct persons who exist simultaneously. Do you remember the analogy with water that we used that described modalism that says that God can be the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit one at a time? It's important for us to show in Scripture why that analogy is truly false. That yes, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they are distinct persons, but they are distinct persons perfectly unified in harmony together, working different roles. I think if I show you a couple places in Scripture that demonstrate this, it will become more clear for you. Okay? Let's first look at Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Quote, And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. End quote. Okay, so in these verses, you have the Son being baptized. You have the Holy Spirit descending like a dove. You have the Father declaring affirmation over Jesus. Each person of the Trinity is working a different role in this scene, and they're all doing it at the same time because they all exist at the same time. Remember, we say modalism is false. We say that all persons of the Trinity are perfectly unified and existing at the same time. The Trinity working distinctively in unison is something that we can even see in creation. I'll show you how. All right, Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Quote, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. End quote. You might be thinking, All right, I see the Father. I see the Holy Spirit. Where is the Son? I'm going to show you. All right, let's turn over to Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. Colossians 1 is a a passage about the greatness of Jesus, okay? So verse 16 says this, quote, For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, end quote. So by Jesus, all things were made. All things were created through him. This is consistent with John chapter 1. I want to show you the first three verses. Quote, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. 
All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. End quote. John identifies Jesus as the Word, who was with God, who was God, who was at the beginning, and all things were made through him. Okay? In Genesis chapter 1, here is a very simple question How does God create anything? He speaks, right? He says, Let there be light, and there was light. God speaking is the presence of Jesus in creation. The word that is God and was with God that all things were made by is found in how Genesis describes God speaking. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they're all present at creation. Isn't that so cool? Before you start thinking, that feels like a stretch. I want us to look at the context in Genesis 1. Go all the way down to verse 26. What do you find? Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Us and our and our are obviously plural words. We have one God, three persons, makes for a plural statement such as that. This idea of the Trinity may be more fleshed out in the New Testament, but it is present on the very first page of the Bible. We see God revealing himself to be this triune God, one God, three persons. Isn't it truly remarkable when you really look how you can see different dots connecting throughout Scripture? I think it's really cool. I think it's really beautiful. And I am looking at my stopwatch app, and it is telling me I need to move on. So we've covered these three distinct persons, and we see that they are working simultaneously. They are working together in harmony. And it is important for us to also read through a few verses that describe that these three distinct persons are not three distinct gods, but rather they are one perfectly unified God, okay? The word we're looking for here is monotheism. Monotheism is the belief in one God. Mono means one. Theism is belief in God. So I know it sounds like we have three gods, that we have Father, Son, Holy Spirit, are all separate. However, the Bible is maybe most crystal clear about this one thing, that there is one God, okay? Start with Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. It's part of this passage we call the Shema, okay? That was just a random fun fact. Quote, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, end quote. As Moses is writing here, he is very clear. I don't even know how to add commentary to the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Do you know what he's saying? He's saying we have one God. Okay, let's go to the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 44, verse 6, quote, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God, end quote. So this is a word from the Lord that's saying, hey, there's no other God other than me. I'm it. I'm the only one. And if there's only one God, that is the mono in the monotheism. Am I right? So look, the Old Testament, we have the writings of Moses. We have the prophets speaking. There is only one God. You can flip to the New Testament. James 2.19 is a great example. Quote, you believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. End quote. James is telling us, hey, you believe there is one God, that there is only one God. Well, congratulations. The demons know that too, and they are terrified of this one God. But the bigger point for our purposes today is that whether you are in the writings of Moses, whether you're in the prophets, or whether you're in the New Testament, the Bible is clear. There is one God, only God one God. Now look, we could go on and on and list many, many verses, but I think you get the point. God is one. There is one God. As we are talking about the Trinity, we are not talking about polytheism, which is the belief in multiple gods. Like Think of like the Roman religion or um, Norse theology or the Greeks, where they just had this whole plethora of different gods that they worship, a god for all kinds of different things. No. What our Bible teaches, what Christians believe, is that we have one God. John 17 is what we call the high priestly prayer. Jesus is praying to the Father. Then in verse 11, he says this, quote, Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are one. End quote. Jesus is teaching that the Father and the Son are one. They are perfectly unified. Since I referenced proof text before, you might be asking, is that what we're doing here? 
Did we just like Google up a bunch of verses that fit a case? Are we reading the Trinity into the Bible? In other words, are we trying to make there be something there that's not actually there? Are we trying to see something that's not really taught in Scripture? That's a good question, and I'm glad you asked. Very smart. I'm glad you're listening to this and really processing what's being said and asking the good questions. But the answer to your good question is no. And the reason I'm saying it's no is because this is too common of a theme. So in addition to the many verses we have read already today, I want to point out that there is this rhythm, there is this pattern of three that we find throughout the New Testament. I'm going to run through some verses quickly just because I want you to get the point. As we move along, watch for the the names that I emphasize with my voice before we get going with this list. I do want to say this list is not exhaustive either. I have not given you a single exhaustive list. I have given you examples of list, okay? So even though it feels like I've read half the Bible in this podcast, we haven't actually covered or listed all the verses that could make our case. I'm just trying to help you get the point. Here we go with our list to show a pattern or a rhythm of three that we find in the New Testament. First up, Matthew 28, verse 19, quote, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, end quote. All three were mentioned, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Now, Romans 15, verse 30, quote, I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ, And by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. Now, it is common for instead of Father, for them to use just God. But again, we see a pattern of three. Ephesians 2, verse 18 For through him we have both access in one Spirit. To the Father. End quote. The Him, if you look in the context of this passage, is clearly Jesus. The Spirit, the S in Spirit, is capitalized, making it a proper noun referencing the Holy Spirit. So we have in our pattern or rhythm of three, we have the Son, we have the Spirit, we have the Father. Now, Ephesians 3, verses 14 through 17. Quote, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with the power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, end quote. In this prayer, we again have the Father, the Spirit, and the Son. All three persons of the Trinity are present. Titus chapter 3, verses 4 through 6, quote, but when the the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared. He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. End quote. If you follow along the verses, it's clear the God our Savior is distinct from Jesus Christ our Savior. Here we have the Father in verse 4, we have the Holy Spirit in verse 5, we have Jesus the Son in verse 6. All three are present once again. The Father and His mercy makes us new through the Holy Spirit who we have access to because of Jesus Christ. All right, 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 2. This was adjacent to a verse we read earlier today. Quote, According to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit, For obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Peter references the whole Trinity in his opener here. He goes, Father, Spirit, Son. All right, I'm just going to do one more. Jude, verses 20 and 21. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God. God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life, end quote. Simply put, this is too recurring of a theme to be made up. It is there throughout Scripture, over and over and over and over again. Listen, if we are to believe that God has inspired His Word, the Bible we have in front of us, that we may know Him, then we have to believe that it is purposeful, that the way He chose to reveal Himself was neither flippant 
nor whimsical. It was intentional. He wanted us to know him accurately. It was important to our holy and righteous and loving and merciful God for us to have a clear picture, even if that picture is hard to understand, but a clear picture on who he is, that he is one God in three distinct persons. Now, I am fully aware that I have not given you a cute phrase to be able to repeat about the Trinity. I haven't given you a single analogy that works. But what I have given you is a number of passages that lead us to the truth that God has revealed himself to us as a Trinity. We are left with one God that reveals himself as three distinct persons who are eternal, equal, and exist simultaneously. I know this is hard to understand and that there are tensions all over the place. But I want to close with one simple idea. I believe it is good news that we cannot fully understand God. Now stick with me here. The God my Bible describes is infinite. He is eternal. He is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. And I am none of those things. I am so, so limited if I being as limited as I am, were able to fully understand God, then he would not be infinite. You see, it is good news that we cannot fully understand God because that means he is simply too big for our brains to fully comprehend. Listen, this would be like trying to fit the Atlantic Ocean inside of a coffee cup. Now, I know some of y'all some heavy coffee drinkers, but ain't none of y'all got an Atlantic Ocean-sized coffee mug you carrying around, right? God is too big like the ocean is too big for a coffee cup. Take comfort that we serve a God, that we are loved by a God who is far greater than we could ever imagine or fully comprehend. Take heart. Thanks for listening to the Steadfast Podcast. I want to remind you that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, Paul wrote this, quote, Therefore, My beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. So, in light of biblical truth, let us be steadfast, immovable. Let us remember that through Jesus, not one labor is in vain, not one trial is in vain, not one effort in all of our lives is in vain. Because He gives purpose, and that purpose rings through eternity. That's all I've got for you today. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget, if you've got questions you would like answered, you can email me at matt at steadfastpodcast.com.